Mark Latham leads in New South Wales the party that I think has some of the sanest policies in the state election, uh, showing some sanity in Australia that at times seems to have gone absolutely mad. I've just given you an example of that, it's wind farms and what they've done to our power prices. So in that spirit, here is Mark Latham, leader of One Nation in New South Wales. Mark, welcome back. I really appreciate uh, this because uh, I think, like I say, uh, big things are at play. Uh, these disgusting wind farms for a start. What are you going to do to save people from these useless, monstrous obscenities on the landscape? Andrew, our policy is to halt the transition to a so-called green energy economy which is sending up electricity prices, which is going to lead to blackouts in New South Wales. We've got that official prediction from AEMO. And most particularly on the point you've raised, it is raping the New South Wales countryside. Now, the National Party ought to hang their head in shame in this state. Their leader, John Barillaro, said, if you go net zero, you'll destroy mining and agriculture in New South Wales. And they voted for it anyway. They rolled over to Matt Keane, the Green in the Liberal Party, Matt Keane, and they also rolled over with the establishment of these massive so-called renewable energy zones, which are vast areas of prime agricultural land, rural landscape that are now occupied by solar farms that go down the valley over the hill, down the valley over the hill, as far as the eye can see, this very inefficient use of land and these unsightly windmills that kill bird life. And also the other big thing that happens, the third element, Andrew, are the transmission corridors, these huge transmission lines that need to be wired up to the western part of New South Wales where they put the solar farms and the windmills. We're the only country in the world that has this thing called rewiring the nation and it's incredibly expensive and yep. the trick always, the trick always from these climate change hysterical people was to say we're going to save the planet, it won't cost you anything. Well, it's costing tens of billions of dollars in transmission wires just in New South Wales alone, and consumers are paying for it. They're paying for it with Matt Keane's $138 million electricity tax. So we would stop it all. Stop yeah, it know. all. And, and, and any sensible person yeah, would, because we, this we never needed the nation it. Would just cost... it will... Albanese was saying, oh, this rewiring the nation is going to cost just $20 billion. Are you kidding? It's going to be multiples of that. Multiples. We already see many of the transition uh, projects, uh, tra transmission lines, uh, what, uh, two or three times over budget. So uh, don't believe that for a second, people. Um, but, you know, then again, you mentioned Matt Keane, supposedly a Liberal, right? This insanity has gone to both sides of politics. You've got no respite from either. Tell me, Mark, how did we get into this mess? We're Australia with huge deposits of coal and gas and oil and uranium now faces energy shortages because we're telling ourselves we can't use any of that. Well, there's a few elements there. One is the God complex that Matt Keane has got. I mean, all politicians have an ego, but if you start to believe your own rhetoric can save the planet, you'd do anything. You'd do any silly thing. And New South Wales, with 0.4% of global emissions, we can't save the planet. We need to save our electricity grid and energy security and uh, do something about the cost of living crisis. But we can't have any influence whatsoever. In fact, my office through the Parliamentary Library and some of the institutions in Britain did an analysis. If you bundle together Keynes' remaking of the entire electricity grid, all the stuff about hydrogen, electric vehicles, uh, about um, uh, the green energy subsidies that run into tens of billions of dollars in New South Wales, if you bundle that together, what's the net impact on uh, the global temperatures. Keane won't answer that question. He doesn't know the outcome or won't own up to it. The answer that came back from the library was 0 0.00055 degrees Celsius over a century. So essentially nothing. So it's a God complex thinking but you can I say... I actually think that's an exaggeration. <laughs> well, well Mate, it, 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 that it, is it, an exaggeration because I think that figure, that figure is actually for the entire country and... That depends on a lot of the presumptions about the sensitivity of the climate to our emissions is true. And there's a lot of deba debate about that too. Yeah, Honestly, the figure is so small, one day Andrew, people it's, wake it's, up it's to this... It's virtually nothing. It's virtually nothing. 
So if yeah, it's, it's, it's an exaggeration, it's the real true. answer is zero. The real answer is zero. And look, it can't be yeah. measured. And, and, and Matt Keane's great-great-grandkids won't see any result that they notice in 100 years' time. So the whole proposition is ludicrous. Oh, they'll see it if they drove through the countryside. Well, they'll well, see, see it if they drove through no, the no, countryside. I'm, to, I'm, to, I'm talking about the impact on global temperatures. And the other big factor yeah, is, is money talks, Andrew. Money talks. The renewable rent seekers are all over the Liberal Party all over them. I mean, the money talks and these people are, are getting money for nothing. I mean, uh, they're getting so many government subsidies for doing everything that they've got their hand out. You've never seen a rent-seeking industry created overnight, but that's what Matt Keane has done. So it's a combination of ego and money. Um, I've got to, two questions I want to ask you about Paul Keating. And one, I'm going to draw from uh, my um, well-used copy of the Latham Diaries that you wrote after... Um, uh, ending as uh, Labor leader. Uh, a wonderful quote. But first, Paul Keating, uh, the former Labor Prime Minister. His attack on Labor yesterday and his defence, his disgusting defence of the Chinese dictatorship was frankly deranged, if you ask me. And I invite people to stick on for the end of the show where we're going to fact check something. Now, you knew him very well. You still know him. Uh, was he always like this or has something gone a little wrong? Well, it was a very colourful display, and I suppose he hopped into a whole range of journalists, uh, calling Peter Harcher old acid drop, uh, as classic Keatingism. I, you know, Paul's a long time out of elected office, uh, nearly, nearly 30 years now, actually. So uh, the rhetoric's become more colourful. And the analysis, I, the, the key point here, it was the analysis correct? Was the analysis in Australia's best national security interest? The answer is no. And I think the thing you're going to quote from the Latham Diaries, we're in sync on one thing, Andrew. We've both got good <laughs> books on our library shelves that we can rely on. So I think the thing you're going to quote there Mate, you're, goes you're to there. the heart of why it was couple... inaccurate. Well, let me now quote from the Latham Diaries. The... Um... I mean, I'm surprised this book doesn't burn in my hands. It's uh, written with such verve. Mark, well, you talk about Paul Keating uh, ringing you uh, in 1999, mm -hmm. uh, your Labor leader. He phones you and he says, Paul explained his strategy with Indonesia. Now, this is Paul Keating who says we shouldn't rely on the US, we shouldn't rely on Britain to defend ourselves from China. In fact, China's not even a threat. That's what he said yesterday. Not even a threat. Paul explained his strategy with Indonesia, the purpose of his 1995 defence pact. And he says this, and I'm quoting Paul, you're quoting Paul. What I wanted to do was put their 200 million people, 200 million Indonesians, in the front line. Their army, our weapons. That was our front line defence of Australia. If China ever went as bad as some people said it could. Can you explain so <laughs> how, how do you marry that with what he said yesterday? Well, you can't. You can't. And it's a shame that uh, none of the young journalists there have got any memory of Australian political history. And they didn't say, and they didn't say to him, Mr Keating, you signed up a defence pact with Indonesia, with Suharto in 1995. Is this what you mean by security within Asia? Is that what you mean by that phrase, security within Asia? And they could have even quoted from my book to say, was your theory that Indonesia would be our buffer if China ever went bad. His words, his words quoted verbatim in my diaries, if China ever went bad. And, of course, in some part, China has gone very bad on Australia. The relationship is soured. We've had this interference in our domestic politics. So that scenario has come about. But it, it, it raises the more important question, Andrew. What is Australia's national interest? To have a security arrangement, a, de a defence pact with Indonesia, who in military terms couldn't blow out a candle, or to have an alliance with the United States and the UK with these nuclear subs and other military hardware for the defence of Australia in the medium to longer term. Now, no one, no one in their right mind would say that Indonesia is the answer for Australia if China goes bad on us, goes really bad and there's aggression and conflict. So Keating, by his own words in 1999, Yesterday's presentation didn't count for a can of beans, you know. It was sort of embarrassing to him in terms of what he said when he was talking about his own strategy as Prime Minister of Australia in 1995 to sign up with the Indonesians. It's just extraordinary to me that this man would, 24 years ago, think that we needed... We did need to defend ourselves from China, but we'd get Indonesians to fight for us and today he says, no, 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 China's not a threat. We can't even uh, rely on the Americans. We might actually put up a better struggle uh, for our safety. I mean, it's just crazy. Mark, um, you won two seats at the last New South Wales election. The next election's uh, Sunday week. 
You've since been joined by Tanya Mihailuk. Uh, you've, if you get a result like that or better this time around, you're probably going to be the kingmaker in the upper house of the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, how are you going to use that power? Well, uh, the likely scenario, according to the polling, is Labor might fall a bit short in the lower house and they'll need the Greens in an alliance, like we saw in the Gillard area, we've, we've seen in, uh, in uh, Tasmania, a Labor-Green alliance in the lower house, and the Greens will be demanding drug legalisation, gender fluidity teaching in schools, and even crazier rush to renewables, close coal and gas yesterday. So we'll be trying to block that kind of green madness. Uh, you need one nation in the upper house as an insurance policy, as a handbrake on the extremes of a Labor-Green alliance in the lower house. But the other thing, Andrew, the feedback I'm getting from the public is that they're very disillusioned with the two-party system and they're urging on One Nation to disrupt it, to shake up the two-party duopoly. You know, Labor and Liberal have had it to themselves for a long, long while and people are saying the competition, the disruption is good. One Nation can be an alternative to show these major parties they're on notice. They're not doing a very good job. They're losing support. Uh, we've seen that, and One Nation uh, is the alternative to shake them up. Mate, uh, anyone knowing you, and uh, I've followed your uh, political career for decades, knows that if you want to shake up, you've come to the right address with Dark Latham. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed for your time. <laughs> A pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be back on your show. Well, let's do it again if uh, we can uh, bear it, because uh, I think uh, the, the viewers deserve it. A bit of a stash is good for your Thank spirits. You. Don't worry. Thank you.